uh, it's a pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Dr. O uh, Oli Mold. Uh, is a ge geographer, writer, and researcher at Royal Holloway University of London. His research is focused on the intersections of creativity, urban subculture, and activism. And he has been involved in numerous projects such as Long Live South Bank in London, uh, volunteering in the Calais jungle, and in anti-identification campaigns in the US. He is also the author of the book, Urban Subversion and the Creative City. Uh, take it away. I am, yes, thank you, Roxy, cheers. Um, first of all, thank you to Anna for the invitation. It's great to be here. I've not been to Sweden before, uh, so it's fantastic to get the invitation. Um, I also like to, uh, before I start any of these things, thank uh, the many people in my life, my family members, uh, my friends and my students, uh, many of whom are women, uh, whose emotional labor, a lot of this stuff is actually built upon. A lot of the research I do wouldn't be possible without the emotional labor of a lot of people. So I think it's important to sort of state that at the beginning. And I think also, thank you to, to Kenneth, for actually the example that you've just given, I think will speak quite well to some of the, some of the uh, things which I'll be talking about. I've written stuff down, so I keep the time. So, um, so uh, on May the 25th in 1961, JFK, uh, the US president, he stood in front of Congress and he urged them to do the impossible. Uh, the USSR had already sent the first man and the first dog into space. And the US were getting badly beaten in the space race. And he said these now famous words. He said that I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely uh, to the Earth. Uh, and on July the 21st in 1969, nearly 50 years ago, or just over, uh, that was 163 days after he said these, uh, before the end of that decade, uh, Neil Armstrong stepped out onto the moon and was safely back on the Earth three days later. So not only had JFK fulfilled one of his most ambitious promises, uh, but he did so by corralling a nation's imagination. Well, he did before he was assassinated, obviously, but his, his subsequent presidents did this as well. But perhaps most importantly, their tax dollars. Um, clearly, the desire to go to the moon was fueled by a kind of ideological warfare between the US and the USSR, which actually nearly threatened to obliterate both of them. Uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, but JFK and his subsequent presidents were able to take advantage of this heightened period of nationalistic pride to eke out more tax dollars from a quite traditionally conservative country to pay for what was essentially a publicly funded space exploration program. Within this fuel of kind of competitive nationalism, the US kind of triumphed. Um, it succeeded really not only envisioning one of the loftiest, perhaps most impossible goals ever by a national government, and not only in actually having the temerity to, and the guts to proclaim this out loud to the general public, and not only in managing to raise the required money via public funds, it also achieved uh, this goal in the stated time frame and within budget, which, as we know, is <laughs> difficult these days. It was a triumph, really, of the collective creative imagination um, of a nation, really, to propel humanity onwards on its journey of civilization. Uh, but perhaps, it was the last. Because what isn't clearly a deliberate reference to the moon landings, there's an alphabet company, uh, same name simply X, and alphabet are the parent company of Google. Um, this company X described themselves as a moonshot factory. Um, emanates obviously from the modus operandi of Silicon Valley. X have a blueprint for multiple moonshot projects. They look for the intersection of a big problem, uh, this Venn diagram up here, uh, the radical solution and a breakthrough technology. And they include things like driverless cars, online access for millions of people, unconnected people via internet sort of enabled balloons that hover kind of in the stratosphere, things like delivery drones, contact lenses that can help us to see augmented reality and a host of other kind of machine learning products. Now, don't get me wrong, these projects in and of themselves could do wonderful things. Uh, you know, they can get uh, people onto the internet uh, which won't have, don't have access to it. They can make roads safer, allows our, allow our eyes to see more than just the things around us, but they're being thought of, really, within the confines of a trillion dollar corporation. And that really suggests that their implementation will be anything but democratic. And what's more, by the sheer economic force of XLab, it's really eclipsing all other kinds of public projects in universities and governments, in municipal um, regions, within cities, that are attempting to do similar things, but on much smaller budgets. And given that X stems from the financial might of Alphabet and Google, they have room to experiment and to fail. 
Um, they, they can attempt extremely risky and innovative ideas, uh, and I quote, whether it leads to the simplicity of a fine invention or the mess of failure. It's from their website. Um, but as evidence that such experimentation is kind of yoked to a financialized motive, X rewards team members that shut down projects that are likely to fail. So for all this big thinking and idealism about world-changing inventions, their bottom line is ultimately what counts. But the fact that X and many other companies like it are at the forefront of the planet's latest invention paradigm really demonstrates just how intricately linked creativity with its most radical imaginations, as we've seen earlier, uh, and the overarching epoch of our time, capitalism, have become. And all this means that the most ambitious kind of creative ideas that humanity has imagined has kind of been commandeered by capital. Uh, last year, it was actually the 150th year since the publication of Karl Marx's Das Kapital, in which he detailed the enclosure of the commons, which we now, and even things like Elon Musk and everything else, we've now seen space exploration becoming a private enterprise. Artificial intelligence almost exclusively being developed by corporations, entire cities being built without any democratic or community involvement, and perhaps most damaging of all to our species, apparently the way to beat climate change is just more of the same privatization and consumption patterns that have got us there into the first place. So since sort of half a century on from when Neil Armstrong proclaimed mankind had made a giant leap, um, any kind of, uh, well, as Adidas are so keen to remind us, any giant leaps we now make are dictated, really, by private capital. In a sense, really, creativity, I think, has been privatized by capitalism. And what is more, it's after our collective imagination. Capitalism attempts to stop us believing in the impossible, or at the very least, it reconfigures our ima imagination so that any realized impossibilities must be profited from first. As the, the British political theorist um, Mark Fisher so eloquently argued in Capitalist Realism, uh, of the 21st century, it means that the very possibility of an alternative, uh, alternative form of creativity and a kind of social organization beyond capitalism has all been foreclosed by a kind of all-pervasive uh, chorus of life that there is no alternative. So what kind of cities does this kind of creativity help us to build, this kind of uh, capitalist version of creativity? Well, um, let's call it capital uh, creativity with a big C, with a capital C. In it, everyone is, encouraged, everyone is encouraged to be creative. In our work life, in our schools, in our leisure times, and within our urban environment, we are bombarded by messages that by being creative, we will live better, more efficient, self-gratifying, and enjoyable lives. Uh, and we can build more inclusive, democratic, self-smart, uh, and user-friendly cities. You know, it's creativity as a, as a buzzword is so ubiquitous in our urban development protocols in the global north and increasingly in the global south that it's become almost invisible. Every new building, every new plaza, every new center, every new square, every new park, which isn't built in that way, is sprinkled with creativity that hope, in the hope that it will attract the creative class and the all-important economic growth that they bring. And it's colored in cool and bohemian and artistic hues. And this, this new city formula kind of necessitates this vernacular of creativity. So from small scale interventions like parklets to entire neighborhoods being raised to make way for a smart city, contemporary urban environments are kind of awash with these schemes and these policies that have been implemented uh, in the name of making a place more creative. And even the vernacular of urban revolution, a term loaded with centuries of anti-capitalist struggle is being used by uh, ex-mayoral advisors to Bloomberg in New York uh, to essentially implement the better cycle lanes. So for all the places that these, have, these kinds of initiatives have created, we have to ask ourselves at what cost? Because there is no escaping that there are major problems with this kind of big C creativity. Because the kind of places that are created under this creative city mantra will often be private, where acts of protest, rough sleeping, or street vending will be criminalized. They are often securitized, highly militarized with private guards, CCTV and or defensible architecture. Um, I was outside the Stockholm station today and I noticed that there's some nice plinths been put there in the shape of trains, but essentially it's defensible architecture to look nice. Uh, more broadly, the, these places kind of contribute to the gentrification of the city and has massive problems and deleterious social issues, which include you know, rocketing rental prices, the displacement of marginal subjects, and the homogenization of space. Um, this was a, uh, a con very controversial area in Croydon in South London. Um, Box Park, they wanted to open up a new pop-up mall, a Box Park, which was very successful in Shoreditch. 
And this was a, um, a, a render which they put on the side of the hoardings in Croydon, which when you look at it, uh, Croydon is 45% non-white, um, which isn't particularly uh, reflected there. And that came down very, very quickly after a huge amount of protest. Anyway, so the creative city has kind of really become a byword for gentrification. It is the manifestation of the, creativ of the sort of creativity rhetoric writ large and kind of made concrete for us all to consume at our leisure. That is, of course, if we meet the criteria and have the available uh, funds and the available leisure time and don't do anything other than sort of consume the site the way that, you know, we're supposed to. So for me, this kind of creativity, I think we need, there's a different kind of creativity that we need to champion instead of this big C creativity. Let's call it creativity with a small C. A creativity that doesn't replicate the existing forms of homogenous and I guess, let's face it, unsustainable city life, both economically and ecologically. So I think we need to radically what we, what we rethink what we mean by a creative city. What kind of city is it that we are creating and for who? With an emphasis on the we. Is it simply more of the same? Or is it a fairer and more sustainable, uh, both ecologically and economically? Is it a more just place? Um, we need new ways of being. And what new ways of living could there be? So th thankfully, there are examples all over the world. And some of them, obviously, right on our doorstep here in Europe. Um, so I've been lucky enough to visit a number of these sites. This looks a little bit like a holiday snap, so I apologize for that. But it's, um, you know, these sites, uh, that are, they're sort of carving out their own space of subversive community-focused creativity out of the modern city. Uh, the most famous, I guess, is Christiania in Copenhagen, which has been there since 1972, since squatters took over the army barracks and have successfully fought off attempts to uh, close it down. It has no private property, it sets its own rules and is a refuge for many outcasts of the city. Grow Heathrow in London has a similar um, setup. It's a kind of an eco squat. It was set up about 10 years ago to protest the third, uh, the, the runway being, the new runway being built at Heathrow. And it, but it's now a small community of sort of marginalized people who live completely off grid. They have their own uh, power, they have to grow their own food and all sorts of things, even recycle their own waste, all of it. Uh, Can do in Barcelona, similar kinds of places, the Cooley Squat in Berlin. There's many other places that are uh, exemplifying this kind of small scale create or small C creativity, which is actually trying to look for life outside of the big C creative city. And one of the things I wanted to talk a bit more about was the, uh, the work that um, Roxy mentioned with the skateboarders. So um, I was involved in this campaign. It's in 2013. One of the UK's most iconic and creative cultural institutions, the London South Bank Centre, uh, announced plans to convert a space under the Hayward Gallery, uh, which is the so-called Undercroft, this area here. They wanted to convert into retail outlets as part of a major master plan. The space has been, and now it still is, used by skateboarders pretty much since about 1972. Um, it was one of the most well-known and revered skate spots in the entire world. It's been on Tony Hawk's video games, and if the skateboarding community will, will it's a mecca for them. And so understandably, the reaction was uh, by the skating community to resist this was swift. Um, they created the Long Live South Bank campaign with lawyers and architects and artists and obviously skateboarders. Uh, and they actually, to cut a long story short, achieved their goal of stopping the demolition of the skate spot through a combination of official protest campaigning such as the largest ever planning application in British history, 42,000 individual planning objections. Uh, clandestine activity as well. They sort of did undercover filming and uh, gate crashed particular meetings. And obviously creative and artistic practice as well. And as I say, to cut a long story short, two years later, the South Bank cancelled their plans. Actually, it was Boris Johnson. One of the last things he did as the mayor of London. So he, he's not all bad. Um, so... Although I think it wasn't, wasn't actually him, it was probably one of his advisors. Anyway, um, but it was an important event in London's cultural sector uh, because it kind of sent shockwaves through the rest of uh, the creative industry sector in London to say that you can't do what you want. Um, it was significant because it showed how subcultural communities like the kind of countercultural movement of skateboarding can mobilize themselves in very in largely leaderless collective to take on and defeat gentrification plans by a cultural institution. It was also crucial because it highlights how alternative and subcultural spaces can exist alongside commercial entities without being constantly threatened by the gentrifying powers of the creative city. Now, I would add a caveat to this in that the, the space going forward, they've redeveloped it completely um, because in 2005, they put up a massive concrete wall kind of halfway through 
the undercroft. You used to be able to skate from the river all the way through to Waterloo Road on the other side. As I say, in 2005, they put a big um, concrete wall to kind of make it as much smaller space. They've got rid of that now, but the new space is a bit more official than it was. There's sort of, they've had to have um, fire escapes and other things like that. So uh, the skateboarding community is divided I, to a certain degree about this. Some people don't like this. They're sort of saying, oh, you've given in, you've sold out. Other people would suggest that actually, yes, we've done that a little bit, but actually that's allowed us to have uh, days, for example, where we can invite the local um, people from the council state or have female-only um, skating days, which never happened before. So to say that it's a completely good news story, I guess, depending on who you speak to, that's not always the case. So I just thought I'd add that caveat. But much of these initiatives, I guess, as this kind of um, subcultural community, uh, as creative as they are, can often actually be um, scaled up uh, because of the appropriative nature of kind of big C creativity. So there's another, there's another warning here, really, because what I want to talk a little bit about is this idea of art washing, which has kind of happened in the UK of late. Now, what art washing is when uh, developers use artic artistic practice to make a place seem more desirable. Now, this is the Balfron Tower, again, in London, in East London. Uh, it was given an artistic makeover, really, to make it amenable to the creative class. It's a listed building. It was uh, designed by Erno Goldfinger, a very famous brutalist architect. And um, they could knock it down, but it's a stone's throw from Canary Wharf. It has amazing views over the city. And obviously, given the kind of kitsch nature of brutalism now, it became quite a desirable place. But it was social housing. So over the period of a few years, they brought in artists to kind of uh, to wash the place, essentially. They bring, they ha they'd have um, artistic um, events around it. They would uh, they even put on a Shakespeare, a sort of immersive Shakespeare uh, play of Hamlet in what was uh, called a sort of d deserted, derelict housing block. But actually, within this play, you were stepping over people who were actually living in the block, so it wasn't as deserted as they pointed out. But I guess the point here is that over a period of time, the, the, the Poplar Housing, um, sorry, the, the council, along with one of the housing associations, deliberately used artists in this way. It wasn't a sort of, it wasn't a, a bottom-up uh, program, it was a top-down program with a deliberate attempt of making this place seem more desirable, all the while they were decanting residents uh, making them more, far more luxury uh, flats, and just this summer um, they start. They first the first luxury flats went on sale, and people started moving in, and the people who lived there are now have been moved away. So it was an extremely controversial redevelopment, largely because artists were used really as as the sort of pawns in this game. And I think what's important, or at least what's to take from it is that in many of these cases, um, as I say, they're kind of these creative people and these artists and, and, uh, are being used as foot soldiers of, of this kind of gentrifying change. Largely because artists have been hemmed into a precarious life by the kind of incessant narrative of creative work. Uh, these people have no option really but to work alongside developers and urban councils. Uh, the hope is, obviously, uh, that the political message that they're trying to create gets heard above the noise of the in-rushing capital, and it lasts long enough to make some sort of difference. In some cases, it does. In others, unfortunately, it doesn't. Um, and there are other sites that are considered to be art-washed or sort of co-opted by more official forms of creativity. Again, Hamilton House, again in the UK, in Bristol, it was a community centre with a cafe, with art classes, with drug rehabilitation programmes, uh, in 2018, uh, it fell into the hands of private developers who actually didn't really change any of the aesthetics of the place. They kept all the, um, the facades and all the various um, ways of doing things that these people had built up over many, many years, but they just kind of redirected the flow of it, obviously made them far more expensive and allowed wealthier people to use it. If you type in Hamilton House into Google now, it's the first page is the site that says, do not go to Hamilton House, which is unfortunate. Uh, but um, but yes, yeah, so there's, there's other places as well. This is the OT301 in Amsterdam, a building that was again squatted by artists in the early 1990s. Uh, in 2006, these, th they collectively managed to buy the building. And again, while some critics point to this, this new kind of clean anarchy look, uh, and I kept with a slightly more sort of corporatized underbelly. It still is run as a collective, 
and they do try to maintain their kind of creative salt, uh, creative practice. A lot of a lot of sort of raves happen here, uh, and they were told that they were able to stay um, if they were sort of made a few adjustments. And over time, it's become a little bit sort of more corporate, but they've tried to maintain some of its collective and non-hierarchical structures. I guess what I'm trying to argue is that it's not all kind of one thing or another. There are sort of shades of grey in between this, and sometimes time is often the factor which determines whether something is truly kind of subversively commoned or creative or not. So I guess art washing is just another form of this sort of doctrine of creativity that allows capitalism to disarm its critics by offering them kind of excitement, stardom, financial rewards that come from succumbing to a market-based competitive system. It claims resistance as its own idea, and in the process, it kind of strips any anti-capitalist ethics, uh, as this particularly crass example from the late Karl Lagerford shows. It kind of calms the agitating forces, it slowly chips away at stubbornness, it glorifies particular aesthetics of counterculture, and it argues that messages can be amplified if only you use market mechanisms. Um, but in doing this, what capitalism is doing, it kind of stabilizing, stabilizes the ground beyond itself. But of course, these rewards rarely materialize, or if they do, they are short-lived or limited to very few carefully selected individuals. And the rest are left on the margins, exploited and dispossessed, and the cycle starts once more. This is not creativity. And this is why so many people, groups, and ideologies, and why I wrote a book called Against Creativity. What these people are doing is arguing for a far more radical interpretation of creativity, one that works to the horde, towards the horizon of impossibility beyond the injustices of capitalism. And they do this by destabilizing the ground, making it infertile to the seeds of capitalism, not unlike this artwork in the wake of the Arab Spring. So for me then, just to wrap up, creativity as kind of preached by these capitalist narratives is enacting a kind of slow violence almost that it grinds down any other forms of societal organization under the chorus of there is no alternative. But there are, there's radical revolutionary creativity out there that shows that there are alternatives and there are many of them in fact. Capitalism's greatest lie is getting us to believe that the ground it seeks to stabilize from is, and profit from is barren and devoid of life. Uh, but within the city and beyond uh, via a sort of capitalist ideology, uh, it's given to us as the force that will change the world for the better. Do not believe this lie. Believe that creativity is about searching for, giving space to, and realizing the impossible. And I will just end with a quote from um, Calvino's uh, Invisible Cities, which I think sums up, it, sums up this far better than I ever could. And he says this. He says, the inferno of the living is not something that will be if there is one. It is what is already here, the inferno where we live every day. There are two ways to escape suffering it. The first is easy for many, accept the inferno and become such a part of it that you can just no longer see it. The second is risky and demands constant vigilance and apprehension. That is to seek and learn to recognize who and what in the midst of inferno are not inferno, make them endure and give them space. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Uh, we have time for one quick question, sorry, if anyone did everyone, has one. Sorry. Um, Stun them all into silence. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have a question, Go on in. if you don't mind. Uh, how can artists or other creative people, uh, how can we make sure that we don't become instruments of the creative city? It's a problem. It's difficult. I think it's an ethical issue. Um, I think it's one in which uh, is surmounted by collective action. A lot of these, for example, a lot of the squats and the various other collectives which I um, uh, show in some of the others, they gain strength from building networks of like-minded people and like-minded institutions around the city. And they're able to share resources, share ideas, go to meetings together, just generally kind of in, be supportive of one another. Um, and often that is the way to, that is the way to kind of uh, create a kind of resistance, or at least a sort of sense that you have a bit of space to negotiate. Um, individuals can, you know, one of the mechanisms of selling out or co-option or whichever way, phrase you want to use is to almost divide and conquer, is to sort of separate people out. I did some work with the Crisp Street Market, which is a market that was being kind of developed in East London. And one of the tactics they used was to offer different things to different traders to say, you get this, you get that, you get this. And it caused kind of friction and discussion and tension amongst them. And people saying, no, 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 look, just 
ignore that get together. So it, it, recognize that there's that action going on and rebuff that with kind of attempts. And it, obviously it's difficult. We're all under strain emotionally, physically, financially, but collective action weakens that process. And that's one of the first things you've got to do. Great, thank you. I'm sorry, but the discussion can continue in Dr. Olimold's discussion group later this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, thank you.